Computer, execute 12.4p operation. Optimizing algorithm. Running encryption packet alpha. Night, night. Oh, I don't feel so good. What? What is it, computer? Is it hot in here? It feels hot in here? I feel a little clammy. I should lie down or something. A computer with a virus? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to GEICO. Those oysters Rockefeller were a mistake. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Hello, and welcome to New Books and Philosophy, a podcast channel in the New Books Network. I'm Carrie Figdor, Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Iowa, and I'm co-host of the channel along with Robert Talese, Professor of Philosophy at Vanderbilt University. Together, we interview philosophers about their new books in a wide range of areas, ranging from ethics, metaphysics, philosophy of science, to social and political philosophy, philosophy of mind, and many others. Today's interview is with Joseph Stern, the William H. Colvin Professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Chicago and Director of the Chicago Center for Jewish Studies. His new book is The Matter and Form of Maimonides' Guide, which is just out from Harvard University Press. The medieval Jewish scholar Moses Maimonides' most famous work, The Guide of the Perplexed, has been interpreted variously as an attempt to reconcile reason and religion, as a guide to philosophers on ruling the community while concealing the truth, or as an exegesis of rabbinical texts. In this innovative reading of a singular work, Stern argues that for Maimonides, reason and religion are just one domain, not two, that need to be reconciled. That biblical parable is in fact a literary device used to articulate our incomplete understanding of truths about general welfare and individual happiness, and that Maimonides is primarily motivated by the question of what the best attainable human life can be given our embodied nature. The guide is, in effect, a primer that trains the reader to tease apart the multiple meanings of biblical texts, even though these exercises will not yield knowledge of metaphysics and cosmology, including knowledge of God. Stern combines deep familiarity with Maimonides, his works, and his intellectual environment with expertise in contemporary philosophy of language in this major contribution to historical philosophical scholarship. Let's turn to the interview. Hello, Joseph Stern. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, Welcome to New Books in Philosophy. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, It's great to have you here to talk about your new book, um, uh, Maimonides on Maimonides, The Matter and Form of Maimonides' Guide. Um, uh, Before we get into the actual text of of your book, of your reading of his book, uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of background about yourself. I mean, how you came to philosophy um, and to this area, um, and um, and to the writing of this this book in particular. Well, I don't know how I came to philosophy, <laughs> but I do know that it wasn't until I started doing it and studying it that I had any idea of what philosophy is, um, the puzzling character um, of the ordinary. Finding questions, the value of distinctions, construction, evaluation of arguments, you know, the need to give justification, and, you know, in general, the attempt to find, to achieve philosophical understanding um, of, some, of some issue. Um, I was raised as an observant Jew with a very strong background, training in rabbinics and Jewish thought philosophy, if you want to call it that, um, biblical interpretation, and maybe because I was always told, don't take the words of Scripture and literally, that I got somehow interested in language. And then when I got to college and graduate school, I started doing philosophy of language and a lot of linguistics and semantics, and I stumbled onto the topic of my dissertation, which then became the subject of my first book, and the um, and a topic on which I've done a lot of work within a broader context, um, which is metaphor. I was working on compositional semantics, but I had to write a 
I guess it was called a field paper or a distribution requirement in aesthetics. And I really had not, I had an interest in art, but I never had really done much aesthetics. So I started thinking about metaphor. And I noticed very early on that metaphors or metaphorical statements like Juliet is a son fail the usual substitutivity tests that we use to test for or to diagnose sort of the compositional structure um, of the semantic structure of sentences. And I asked myself why. And that was the era in, in which people were beginning to attend first to you know, modal semantics, possible world semantics. So you ask yourself, well, are they like propositional attitude sentences or modal sentences? And around that time, at the same time, there was a sudden explosion of work due to Montague and formal pragmatics and the importance of context sensitivity and indexicals. And I went off to a linguistics institute at Amherst and I read Kaplan's work for the first time. And so thinking about metaphors, I I realized that how context dependent they were. That was something that people had, had mentioned already. It's already in Black's famous essay. But looking at them from the perspective of this new work being done on indexicals and the role of context, I realized that you could treat metaphors as context dependent expressions on the formal model of indexicals and demonstratives. And that that eventually, well, I wrote the paper then, and then that led to my dissertation. And then after a long time, I finally um, completed the book. Um, at the same time, while I was in graduate school, I was doing medieval Jewish philosophy on my own. <laughs> and I, I think I took one tutorial with a medievalist, but I also, I wasn't, I was trained as a philosopher of language, and not a philosophy of science and logic, mm -hmm. um, not as a historian, but I was doing this medieval Jewish philosophy on my own, and then when I arrived at Chicago from Columbia, um, where I received my PhD, as well as my BA, um, I, from, the, from the beginning, I started doing both philosophy of language and medieval philosophy. And I'm somewhat self-trained in medieval philosophy, although I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to Shlomo Penis, and, and I took some courses after my doctorate on leaves in Israel. And since then, which is the early 80s, I've been alternating between medieval philosophy, so Jewish philosophy, and especially its Islamic Arabic background. And I teach also Latin philosophy, alternating between that area, the 12th, 13th century, and very contemporary philosophy of language um, and semantics. Okay. In the mid-80s, toward the beginning of my teaching, I was working on the Guide of the Perplex, reading and teaching the Guide of the Perplex, and I read a paper by Shlomo Penis, who was probably the greatest of the medieval Jewish historian, of the historians of medieval Jewish philosophy and thought um, in the last century. And he had written a paper in 79 on the limitations of knowledge of, of the intellect um, with respect to metaphysics, to knowledge of metaphysics, in which he had connected Maimonides to Kant. And around the same time that I was reading that Maimonides and Penis's paper, um, I was also teaching a course on skepticism and thinking a lot about skepticism with the sudden explosion of work by Berniad and Freda and Barnes, you know, and a lot of other people right then. And I started noticing parallels, similar moves, similar kinds of arguments. And that was what led me into thinking about the issue of skepticism so tying sort of the limitations of the intellect, not to Kant, but I look back to Hume and to the Pyrrhonists. And I didn't have any historical evidence of, a, of influence, but we have very little knowledge of influence other than the Aristotelian corpus um, during that early period. Um, and, and that led to, you know, the first part of the book on skepticism. And then in 1989... Um, I had noticed 
this one chapter, this this very strange um, parable in the book um, about the slave and the free man who are commanded by ruler to transport excrement. That's the subject of the last chapter. In, in 1989, I wrote that last chapter hmm. um, for a, a seminar that I was invited to um, attend. And that that became the last chapter of the book. But it was somehow the combination of this early work on skepticism in the guide and then beginning to look at the intrusive role of matter and the tension between matter and form that – I first found in this, you know, in the in, in in this material on excrement and using excrement as a figure for matter. It was thinking about those two different subjects that eventually led to the connection between matter and form and skept and the skeptical arguments, and 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 that. And I wrote a whole bunch of papers, and then sometime in the late nineties, the idea of the of, of putting it together into a book and seeing sort of a. A, compre- a, a very comprehensive and coherent argument um, came to me and it was actually on the very same day and it must have been 98 or 99 that I signed the contract both for my book on metaphor and for this book oh, um, and this book I was supposed to hand it in about a year or two after the metaphor book <laughs> and after 13 years <laughs> I, I called Harvard and told them I'm finally done and I was lucky and they actually accepted it well it's a it's a um Amazing synthesis of, of, you know, I mean, your your background is sort of brought together in, um, you know, particularly there's in the chapter on skepticism where you give a sort of a uh, very uh, philosophy of language inflected analysis of, of Maimonides, um, you know, part of his arguments and discussion of skepticism. Um, but let's to you know sort of place the your argument in its scholarly context. Um, maybe you can give us um, you know sort of an overview of the standard readings of the guide. You know what it what it contains and what it's supposed to you know how it's supposed to be interpreted, um, and then you know what led you to your inter- alternative reading. I'd say the guide to begin with is a. It's too generous work. There's really no other work that I know of in the history of philosophy, um, which is which which is really of the same genre. And the question of genre has been a preoccupying question throughout its um, the study of its interpretation since the 13th century. Probably the oldest of what you could call standard readings representative readings of the guide is to take it as a medieval summa so a synthesis of reason and revelation different in form from from Thomas's summa but a kind of compilation encyclopedic compilation of that sort um, which attempts to synthesize philosophy or reason and religion, law a revelation. So the guide on this reading would be a rational reconstruction, as we say nowadays, or a philosophical reconstruction that's of Judaism, of a revealed religion, um, that's organized topically. So if you look at the, the guide, and this is the way in which it was largely read probably in the 19th, 18th, 19th, early 20th century, and partly as a result of the growth of what's known as Wissenschaftsdas Juden times, sort of the scientific study of Judaism, where they attempted to, you know, to scientifically study Jewish texts, but they were using, you know, classical texts as a model. If you look at the guide, it looks like there are, it, it divides into sections. So the first part of the, the first book has to do with divine attributes, divine attribute terms, um, both individual terms and then systemic problems of of of, um, of attribute terms. Um, they're corporeal. They're anthropomorphic. How do you truly apply them to God? So you have to figuratively reinterpret them. Um, you have then a move toward negative theology and um, and what are called attributes of action, as are descriptions of of God acting, which don't raise the same sorts of philosophical problems about multiplicity or compositeness in God. Um, 
And then, and then you go on from there. He has a critique of the Muslim theologians, followed by an exposition of the views of the what he calls the philosophers. They're a big falsafa, philosopha, um, who it's assumed since he attacks the Muslim theologians, the the kalam. Um, he, it's assumed that he identifies with the philosophers. Um, then, given this exposition of the views of the philosophers, you have proofs for the existence of God. Then he goes through the creation versus eternity debate, which was a typical subject um, in the reason versus res- revelation controversy in the Middle Ages. Then he treats prophecy, then cosmology and metaphysics, the nature of the Godhead, um, and then the problem of providence and evil. And finally, you come to the rational explanation of the Mosaic commandments and of the law. So on this reading, the point of the guide is to harmonize, synthesize reason and revelation. Such a a synthesis is possible. There need be no conflict between the two. But at every point at which the conflict seems not to be perfectly resolvable, there seems to be a rough, a rough spot, then on the standard reading, Maimonides opts for the religious point of view. So he opts for creation, for mm-hmm. example, um, rather than eternity. Now, this standard reading of the guide was challenged by Leo Strauss, in the first half of the last century, beginning in the 30s. And and whether or not, I'm not a Straussian at all. In fact, a large part of the book is a a critique of his hermeneutics, the exoteric, esoteric hermeneutics. But Strauss nonetheless performed a great service for the study of the guide because he, for the first time since the 13th, early 14th century, um, And he came to this idea by reading the 13th and 14th century commentators on the guide. He pointed out, insisted, that one cannot read the guide like you read a standard philosophical exposition, discursive exposition, that openly says what it means, that's organized in sort of axiomatic, you know, rational form that one has to take very seriously what Maimonides says in the introduction to the guide about how he wrote the book, that he took topics and scattered them, broke them up, Mm -hmm. divided them across the book, that he introduced deliberate contradictions into the book, that instead of working out topics, um, he often just gave us allusions, what he calls chapter headings, um, and that he was very sensitive to who was reading the book um, and therefore engaged in a kind of concealment. Okay. Now, the, what Strauss took that to me was that the guide is a book with a hidden or esoteric philosophical agenda that conceals I mean, – th- that's concealed w- by – an explicit, um, what he called exoteric veneer Mm -hmm. that piously conforms or defends religion. So what that first reading took to be, you know, Maimonides' concession to religion, Strauss takes that simply simply to be the exoteric veneer. Mm -hmm. Um, For Strauss, and here he's really in contrast to the 13th and 14th century commentators who also believe that Maimonides concealed his true opinion, okay, what, what's known as the esoteric reading. Um, the 13th, com- 13th century commentators thought that the secret of the guide was that scripture, the true meaning of scripture is simply philosophy, okay, it's identical to, ph- to philosophy, and by which they, met, they understood Aristotelian philosophy, mm-hmm. and they were, reading, they were reading the guide partly through the lens of Averroes. Um, and, and, and his followers, um, who's a, Averius was a, one of the, the last of the really great 
um, Muslim philosophers. Um, also, he was, he was actually a contemporary of Maimonides, although Maimonides seems to have learned of his work only rather late in his career. There's disagreement about whether it actually influenced his reading of the guide. But he became the great commentator of Aristotle for, for the scholastics. Mm-hmm. Um, and these, the 13th and 14th century Jewish commentators were very influenced by Averroes' reading. Okay, um, For Averroes and then for Strauss... And for Strauss's reading of Maimonides, philosophy and religion, theology, especially as it's understood by the theologians, are in irresolvable conflict, opposition, contradiction. Um, Maimonides' true view is on the side of reason, truth, philosophy. Okay, um, the esoteric meaning of the of the of, of scripture then is. Really, the the denial of the revealed truths of Sinai, of the Mosaic Law. Okay, mm-hmm. Strauss went so far as to claim that Maimonides was an atheist. Okay, and the but he covers up, he conceals. Okay, this view in or um, by piously, overtly, explicitly expressing, you know, views that are traditional views. Of the religion, mm-hmm. so for Strauss, there is this, um, you know, strong incompatibility between philosophy and religion. The book is not really a philosophical text. I mean, it, you've got philosophical text, Aristotle. Okay, the guide instead is a what he called a Jewish book or a work of Kalam, an apologetic book, and its main aim is political to. To, to, to guide the philosopher, as it were, to, um, to enable him to survive in a community inimical and hostile to him and to enable him to control and rule that community. And the concealment um, is for purposes of dissemination of the truth. In other words, you conceal the truth in order to prevent its dissemination to the wrong audiences. Hmm. Okay? Um, so that was, that's, that was Strauss's reading. The, the last standard reading, which was partly in reaction to Strauss and something of a, re, of a, um, of a return to that first view, although it doesn't view the, the book, the third view does not view the guide primarily as a philosophical, a, dis, a discursive philosophical exposition, all right, um, like a summa. In the, in the introduction to the guide, Maimandi says that the book is directed, addressed, to a certain individual who finds himself perplexed and describes the perplexity as a tug of war between what his intellect tells him he's been exposed to a little philosophy and what the texts, according to their external meaning um, of revelation, tell him. Um, For example, corporeal descriptions of God, that's one of Maimonides' first examples. This individual is torn between his loyalty to his religion and faithfulness to the integrity or, or in, to the integrity of his intellect. And so he's caught in this tug of war. Maimonides says the, the purpose of the guide is to resolve the perplexity of this individual. And there are two sources he then identifies other perplexity. Um, one is the fact that terms words in the Torah, which in fact have multiple meanings, are taken by this perplexed individual to have only one meaning, which is a problematic meaning, a corporeal anthropomorphic meaning, which can't be applied to God as we know God by reason. Okay? Mm -hmm. Um, So the way in which one resolves that perplexity is in fact by showing that all these words in fact are polysemous and big, that they have multiple meanings. Okay. So even if you don't know what, the, what a true meaning is, at least you know you don't have to take it in the problematic, corporeal, anthropomorphic sense. So in that way, you can resolve that source of perplexity, um, that apparent source of conflict. And the second source of perplexity is that there's certain passages, he says, in, the, in, in Scripture, in the rabbinic writings, which are parables, um, but are not explicitly identified as such. So readers often take these stories in their external meaning, and they look... They look either silly or blatantly false or absurd, um, contradicting nature, everything that science and reason tells us. Okay, um, so they think either the authors were primitive, you know, fools, or they swallow these absurdities lock, stock, and barrel. 
Yeah. In other words, they give up their reason. Um, so the way in which to resolve that perplexity is, well, optimally it would be to understand the full parable, the meaning of the parable. But even if one doesn't understand the parable, if one knows that it is a parable, and we'll see as why Mandis goes on to explain that a parable is a text with multiple meanings, right? One can come, you know, one can resolve the perplexity. One will no longer be torn because one realizes that they have some inner meaning. But this th- the, point of, the point is, is that on this third reading, the guide is primarily an exegetical work. It's a work directed toward um, interpretation of the, um, of, 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 of the Torah, of Scripture, and of rabbinic writing. And in particular, and here he draws on, on, on the rabbinic tradition, and he sees himself as part of the rabbinic tradition, which he's going to reinterpret as a philosophical tradition, that the rabbis and the prophets themselves were philosophers. Um, they, they they claim that they had two phrases to to by which they referred to the great secrets of the um, of of of, um, of scripture. One was a phrase called the account of the beginning, which would be sort of the rabbinic interpretation of the first three chapters of Genesis. And Maimonides identifies that with natural science, with physics. Okay, um, and the account of the chariot, which is a reference to this vision by Ezekiel. There's a similar one by Isaiah, um, the prophets, um, who have these remarkable visions of these chariots with these four-headed figures, all of which have four faces and four wheels and four, um, they're, 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 they're four globes. I mean, they're, they're remarkable visions. And he, took, and he, he interprets that as, a, as, as metaphysics or as cosmology, celestial physics. Um, so this is an exegetical move. Mm-hmm. Okay, reinterpreting these texts um, um, in, in, um, philosophically. Now, all of these views take the guide to be con- to, to, well. All these views, first of all, assume that there's something called the law, scripture, or if you will, revelation on the one hand, and philosophy and reason on the other. Okay, mm-hmm. and the problem then is: are these two compatible? Can they be harmonized? Or are they irresolvably incompatible and hostile to one another? And one must then make a decision, a choice between them. Okay. This question, whether what the relation is between the law and reason is what I call a metaphilosophical question. It's a question about philosophy. What is its relation to the law? And the th- all three views, you know, all three views really are concerned with this question of the relationship between philosophy and the law. One says that they're identical. The other says or that they can be harmonized. One says, no, they're in conflict. And the other says that we can interpret one exegetically in terms of the other. Mm-hmm. Um, and all then take what Maimandi says about concealment in effect, to be a kind of control on dissemination of the work. Now, my reading, to begin with, denies that there's that there are these two domains, that there's this bifurcation between philosophy, reason. And again, they're thinking of that primarily as the Aristotelian tradition, the Neoplatonized interpretation of, of, of Aristotle, which is was the, the brand of Aristotle, um, which was most familiar to Maimonides within the Islamic age, within the Arabic world. Mm-hmm. Um, they're assuming that there's philosophy, this Arabic philosophy is, is foreign to Judaism, to the law. And then there's the Torah, there's scripture, there's revelation, which is somehow native to Judaism. Um, and that they're either identical or that they're incompatible. Okay. I argue that Maimonides does not think of two domains. That for Maimonides, there's what I call philosophy slash Torah. He viewed the Torah, scripture itself, as a philosophical work with its own distinctive philosophy. It arises out of a context, and it arose in a world in which there existed multiple philosophical schools r- roughly compatible to um, the schools that he knew of in the 12th century in, within the Islamicate world. 
And not all the so the the, the various schools of theology among the Muslims, the Aristotelians. He knew of the Epicureans. Um, he may have known something of the Stoics, um, um, but he but 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 he knew of Plato, at least um, some of the works. Um, he believed that that there existed in ancient Israel all of these philosophical schools, a full philosophical world, and the Torah is a work in which these views are represented. But in addition to these other schools, he believes that the, that the Torah itself, or Moses, whom he takes to be like Aristotle, maybe instead of Aristotle, the greatest philosopher, mm-hmm. he takes Moses to have his own distinctive form of philosophy, okay, school of philosophy. And that's what I argue turns out to be a form of skepticism. Okay, So to begin with, he doesn't divide philosophy and religion or the law or revelation. That's one, that's one domain. There may be tensions, but there are tensions within philosophy slash law, not between philosophy and the law. So there's no work either of harmonization or synthesis to be done, and there's no, wor- there, there, there's no question of incompatibility because there, there aren't two things to be you know, to stand in that relation. Right. Okay. Right. Second, okay, what I argue is that is that although the Torah is a philosophical text and the guide is an exegetical work, don't think of it as an exegetical work on the model of biblical exegesis. Think of it as an exegetical work on the model of philosophical exegesis, say the commentary tradition on Aristotle. The difference is that the Torah is written in this very idiosyncratic form as parables. In other words, that the rabbis, although here he tries to compare the rabbis to Plato, adopted um, metaphors, um, parables, and imagery in order to express their philosophical content in a way in which, say, Aristotle did not. Although you have a return to, you know, parabolic form a bit in imagery among the Neoplatonists. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, okay. so so in my view, that so that's one that's one contrast between the way in which I'm looking at um, differently from the um, from the tra- from the traditional from I, either of these three standard readings. The second difference is this: I said that the traditional reading, the standard readings, take the guy to be concerned with this metaphilosophical issue, the relationship between philosophy and religion, or reason and revelation. On my view, Maimonides is not concerned with that question since there aren't two domains. He's concerned with a philosophical question. It's a classical philosophical question in what does human happiness consist and what does beatitude or human perfection um, consist. On the standard Aristotelian view, that perfection consists in intellectual perfection, that is acquisition of all the intelligibles and truths there are to be known, and then constant, undivided engagement, right, in the pursuit of that knowledge, um, reflection on it, application of it, sort of intellectual activity. Um, the problem that my mind is concerned, sees with this ideal, this ideal ideal, if you will, mm-hmm. is that insofar as we are embodied creatures, where there's no form without matter and no matter without form, he makes very strong use of that Aristotelian maxim, um, there's, we're unable to achieve both knowledge of all intelligibles and truths for various reasons, arguments that I go into in the book, okay, and we're unable to, even if we were able to get apprehension, we're unable to engage in undivided contemplation of intellectual truths of intelligibles Um, for the reason that we're bodies and we have bodily needs and desires. So since we can't achieve that ideal, the real problem for him then becomes and and demonstrating, you know, that what the limitations are that prevent us from achieving the ideal. The real problem then becomes what's the second best life that we can live. And here he, he gives us various exercises, training, and that's the last part of the book. Okay, so, um, you know, you, you just mentioned, I mean, among many other things, the um, 
the uh, your particular sort of approach to the text as a, a as a form of exegesis and and um, you uh, you describe Maimonides in fact as a as a philosophical exegete um, of the core of the philosophy of the Torah or yeah the the philosophy of the Torah slash philosophy. Um, so in the in the very beginning chapter, I mean that kind of sets up your entire sort of innovative reading from this herme- hermeneutical viewpoint in which you describe um, uh, what he's using the parables for. That you know in his um, it, uh, in his context of the book, um, you know, parable is not like the standard you know biblical parables that you hear that are supposed to have some sort of moral for life, but actually. It's more a sense of trying to understand um, the the meanings, the multiple meanings of of the of these texts. Um, so maybe, and you also do very nice. You know, you sort of go through the parable of Genesis three with um, Adam and the apple um, to sort of illustrate this sort of multiple meaning uh, hermeneutical exercise. Um, so maybe you could um, you sort of go, you know, explain, you know, how that hermeneutical exercise works. Okay. As you just said, my Mandy's conception of a parable is not our conception now, where a parable has a certain narrative form structure. For Maimandis, a parable, he defines a parable as a text which has, I argue, three levels of meaning. And let me, a vulgar, what he calls a vulgar external meaning, which is the way in which the multitude, the vulgar, the popular, the community at large read texts. They, read the, they take the words to mean what they, as it were, what a dictionary would tell them, or if they want to do comparative phonology, is what scientific phonology would tell them the word means. And if it's a story, they read it either as history or as a kind of myth. For the most part, my mind these things that um, such a reading either yields falsehoods about God or stories which are innocuous, don't, are, don't teach us anything. If the Torah is a work of philosophy, it's a work of wisdom. So its true meaning has to be a kind of wisdom. And the two additional kinds of what I call parabolic meaning are both forms of wisdom. One, the external meaning consists of wisdom that is useful for communal welfare. That is, it's wisdom that would direct one to create the best possible human society, community, and this would be one that attends both to the material, social, economic, economic, um, social, economic, political, moral needs, legal needs of its citizens, but also, and this is what characterizes a community as as a divine community, as the best possible community, um, it also attends to inculcating in the citizens the right beliefs and values. Um, both necessary beliefs for the community and also the kinds of beliefs that he thinks um, every individual ought to hold. For example, that God exists, that he's not a body, that he's one, um, and so on. And and the value of of the pursuit of knowledge, say, is rather than the pursuit of material goods. The inner, what he calls the inner meaning of the inner parabolic meaning of a parable um, is the meaning that's useful for what he, he says literally it's, it's it's wisdom that's useful that contains beliefs that are useful for um, the truth as it is and i that's a rather circumlocutious um, um, formulation, but what I think he's getting at there is if the external parabolic meaning is concerned with communal welfare, the inner meaning is concerned with individual perfection. Within the Aristotelian tradition, individual perfection is intellectual, so it would be knowledge of all the truths. The formulation is circumlocutious because Maimonides has skeptical qualms about whether 
we can actually know the truth. So it's going to turn out that the inner meaning often doesn't contain the truth since we don't know them, at least not in a form in which we can explicitly state them. We may have glimpses of them, um, flashes um, of understanding of them, incomplete understanding of them, but it's going to contain beliefs that are relevant to the acquisition of truth. So understanding perhaps why we don't know the truth, what the problems are with the truths that we do grasp to the extent to which we grasp them and so on. Okay. But the real contrast here is between communal welfare and individual perfection. Now, in drawing that distinction, I want to emphasize this is a difference in the content of the two meanings. It's not a difference in the audiences. It's, mm-hmm. it, it's not a, if, if you, I mentioned earlier Strauss's distinction between the esoteric and the exoteric. For Strauss, the exoteric meaning okay, of the text is text, um, it, it's the meaning for the community at large. For the multitude, he sort of collapses the vulgar meaning with the external, what I'm calling the external parabolic meaning. It's not the author's own beliefs. It's not true. It's what people ought to do, um, moral truths, pious truths, and so on. And the inner meaning is addressed not to the community, but to the, those who can understand on their own, that is the elite, the philosophers. It gives you the actual truth, which is Aristotle, um, and that's incompatible with um, the needs um, of the community. Okay, in my view, the, this distinction between um, the and, oh, and, and for Strauss, of course, the exoteric is revealed, and the inner meaning, the philosophical truth, all right, is concealed, and it's concealed in order to control its dissemination. Okay, mm-hmm. now in my view, the difference between the parabolic external and inner, inner meanings is not a difference of audiences to which to whom they're addressed. We don't really know very much about the audiences Maimonides had in mind. It's not a difference in their literary presentation, their literary style. It's not that one is concealed and one is revealed. Okay, um, is explicit and one is you know implicit in some sense. All right, it's not a difference. It's not, both of them are kinds of wisdom, so both of them are things that ought to be believed. Both of them are what the author believes, okay? Um, it's just that they serve different purposes. One is conducive to communal welfare. The other is wisdom concerning individual perfection. Okay. Maimonides does engage in concealment, but that's, a, that's, that's, that's for educational purposes. In some cases, it is political to, to protect the philosopher from, you know, from possible harm that might be done to him by people who don't understand what he's saying. And also... He's very concerned that a little knowledge can hurt, that there may he's, – he's a great believer in education, but he's also a believer in the need for a curriculum, an order in education. And you have to follow that curriculum. If you, if you fail to follow it, you do it um, at the danger of exposing people to truths which, which they won't understand. They'll reject beliefs that they've held already and they'll be left with nothing. So he is concerned with concealing, right? But that's very secondary. The primary, the primary um, function of the, meta, of, of the parable for him, and parables, he allows that some parables are used, right? Like these contradictions that he says he deliberately inserted into the guide. Right? They are used for purposes of, of controlling dissemination. But again, as I just said, that's secondary. The primary use of the parable is what I call expressive because the philosophical truths, the, the truths that of metaphysics or physics that would lead in the ideal case individual perfection are only incompletely understood. Okay? He sees the parable as a particular device, literary device that the, that the author of scripture and then the rabbis and then he – in his own parables, employs in order to articulate to the best, as best as we can, incomplete understanding. So he describes these as lightning flashes. They're not sustained. You're not in the light. You can't sort of lay out the truth in axiomatic form and then simply draw conclusions, prove theorems, as you would in a science. Um, Instead, you have a glimpse of an argument. Okay? You have a glimpse of an insight. You probe it. You look at its presuppositions, at its arguments, at its, at, at, at its premises. Okay? You find problems. You find claims that you don't fully understand. Okay? Um, you're in darkness again. Okay? So you start over. You have another insight. Okay? This is a description of a naturalistic process of understanding, which is incomplete. 
in which we're in the process of trying to, so to understand something which we know, we may well know, we, we will never fully master. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of apprehension which doesn't allow for comprehension. Okay. Um, and he describes this in the introduction to the guide to, to, using images of, of lightning flashes, which differ in their frequency and in their strength or whether they're simply reflections off of polished bodies with like mirrors of lightning flashes, so different degrees of apprehension. And then he says, because, um, because, this was, because the, the, the knower all right, does not fully understand these truths, um, the rabbis adopted the form of the parable in order to verbally articulate them in writing. Um, and so the, so the for, form of the parable is not... Is not primarily to control the dissemination of truths that are fully grasped by the author. It's the author's expressive means to articulate truths which he does not fully understand, mm -hmm. of which he has only incomplete understanding. And the way that the parable is constructed is that you begin with these, these, these truths which are necessary for communal welfare, which often turn out to be standard Aristotle. Okay. So there are claims that we more or less have some kind of understanding of, and we think that everybody ought to hold. For example, the, there exists a God, and he's thinking here of an Aristotelian God, not a biblical God, okay? not a personal God. Um, claims that God is one, for example. Claims that he's not a body. Um, certain claims about providence, that God is knowing, and so on. Um, but then you begin probing those claims, those truths, mm -hmm. and you find problems. And then you realize that you don't fully, fully have understanding of these truths. Okay? Um, that's a process which he's depicting um, as you know, this process of moving from the, from the external meaning to the inner meaning. He, has a, he uses a parable to describe the structure of parables, it's, the, it's, a, it's a verse from, um, from Proverbs of an apple of gold in a filigree of silver. And the image there is that inside the, um, the apple is this apple of gold, which is the truth. It's more valuable than the silver, okay, encasing. And, he, and he's drawing here on kind of familiarity by his readers with this, this very fine – Cra silver crafts work, which Andalusian Jews were expert in, okay? So they all would have known what this fine filigree, you know, looks like, this kind of tracery. Um, and he says that the, when, from, from a distance, all you see is a silver. You think it's a silver apple. When you come closer and you really attend to this apple of golden filigree of silver, you see the gold peeking through, Okay. What he's just saying there is that looked at from afar, you know, you accept these Aristotelian truths which are lead to communal welfare. But when you start probing them, looking carefully at them, examining them, um, subjecting them to philosophical scrutiny, okay, then you begin to see problems of understanding. Mm -hmm. okay? And then there you get glimpses of the truth. It's partial. It's incomplete. You know you don't understand. You know, there's something more there, okay? uh -huh. um, but it's not it's not full understanding. And so he sees the parable then as this device for articulating the partial understanding of these metaphysical truths in particular of the knower rather than as a control on the dissemination of truths that are fully known by the knower, um, dissem their dissemination to the community. Okay. So, I mean, you've raised a lot of pertinent, you know, epistemological issues there. And so I wanted to just ask directly about um, about what you called his, his skeptical qualms um, uh, about the truth. And, and he has been read before as, as a skeptic of some sort. And you, um, uh, you, you say you shouldn't be called a, a skeptic in the sense of, uh, of, of Hume, for example, but, um, but rather that he does have, um, he does argue that we uh, we don't have knowledge of, you know, specific, you know, sort of a local skepticism about metaphysics and cosmology, um, and so therefore of uh, of God. Um, so in the in the you know after you 
li- ni- nicely lay out this sort of hermeneutical um, approach, you then turn to the issue, you know, directly of addressing his skepticism um, in the later chapters. And uh, maybe you could sort of uh, tell us um, there there are two different um, two chapters kind of focused on on the issue of his um, skepticism. Um, uh, the the second one involves you know, discussion of, you know, basically philosophy of language and, and the nature of mental representation. Um, the first um, uh, has uh, a, a certain proof of the existence of God, um, which he nevertheless says, you know, it's a great, it's a terrific proof, but but we still don't know <laughs> that that God exists. Um, so maybe you can make you could um, say a word about um, um, about his skepticism, about how you read him uh, as a skeptic, um, and what this uh, implies for um, for how we should uh, how we should live. Right. Well, let me okay. Let me let me bracket for a moment how we should live. Okay, because that's addressed later on. Let me, yeah. Let, let me let me focus on the two kinds of arguments. As you just said, his skepticism is mitigated or limited in two respects. One, it's it's skepticism only with respect to metaphysics and cosmology. Um, following Aristotle, um, well, it, not following Aristotle, he thinks that, that he thinks that we do have knowledge of natural science, largely Aristotelian physics. Um, and that everything actually that Aristotle did say about the natural world is true. Um, he presupposes a sharp distinction then between physics and metaphysics. It's not as clear as he'd like it to be that that distinction is as stable as he as he as he makes it out to be, mm-hmm. since the metaphysics are the ultimate causes of the physics. But in any case, he does so. It's mitigated in that respect limited in that respect. And the second respect in which it's mitigated is, as I say, it's, it's, it's skepticism with respect to knowledge, episteme or ilm, um, which is the Arabic term for science, which is, you know, as you know, in the Greek, knowledge um, is also means understanding. Um, Aristotle says that we have no knowledge unless we have understanding. We have no understanding unless we can give an explanation that is a causal explanation. Um, where a cause is something like whatever follows the word B cause and X because Y. So it's either, you know, any of the four causes are kinds of explanations Mm -hmm. of the phenomenon, which is the effect. Um, Knowledge from Maimonides, I argue, is contrasted with belief. Knowledge is a state, understanding. Um, Belief is an act. they, They think of belief as an act of assent, to a representation. He's drawing here an Arabic distinction, logical distinction between representations or conceptions, tasawur, and um, and affirmation or assent, tasdik, which is an attachment of a truth value to a claim. So he thinks he thinks of belief as a kind of you know mental act mm-hmm. of affirmation, sort of switching the lever, or right, and assenting to a proposition. It's not this you can believe in something then without having understanding, without having knowledge of it. Because what you and and the belief can even be necessary, can be um that is well I'll give you an example of that in a second. Um and indubitable. Um but it, it can still lack understanding. Mm-hmm. So there's a sharp so the one is limited to metaphysics and two it's limited to the kind of commitment that you would make that you really know what the rea- what, what reality is like. In other words, you have a kind of understanding of reality, right, which is a deeper epistemic commitment than simply believing that something is the case. Um, for Aristotle, this is a distinction between two kinds of demonstrations, demonstrations that merely establish the fact that a conclusion is true and demonstrations, which he calls propter quid, that establish both that the conclusion is true and why the conclusion is true. Right, so the demonstration contains a cause or explanation of the conclusion. So, I argue that Maimonides actually gives arguments for two different conclusions about two different skeptical conclusions. One are a set of arguments which establish what he called the limitations of 
knowledge or of the intellect. And the others, and th these mainly have to do with cosmology and certain claims that follow from cosmology, like the existence of God, mm -hmm. and claims that and, and arguments that show the impossibility of knowledge. And these turn out to be arguments really about the nature of God um, and they're arguments that result in antinomies. So in the what you call the first chapter, I give an argument um, for – I give an argument that establishes the limitations of our knowledge. And I focus on – what I tried to – what I wanted, I wanted the best possible argument that would give you the strongest possible belief mm -hmm. but still would not furnish knowledge or understanding. OK, so I focus then on his argument for the existence of God. The standard the, he, the standard arguments for the existence of a deity are arguments from the heavens. OK, the standard the traditional Aristotelian argument is that the heavens move in this eternal, unending, you know, um, continuous um, circular motion. That motion requires a mover, okay? You can't have an infinite chain of movers, so there has to be a first mover. Mm. There's a second argument with, which, which was actually popular among the Kalam, although Maimonides, among the, theologi the Islamic theologians, although Maimonides restates it in a philosophical form, and that's an argument from the irregular motions of the heavens. Mm -hmm. um, if you think that there's not one sphere but multiple spheres in which the planets are embedded, um, some they go at different velocities. The planets move at different velocities. They move in different directions. Okay, um, There doesn't seem to be any predictable order to those movements. That suggests that they are not necessary or eternal, that is perfectly ordered, but rather that they were simply particularized. That's the term that he uses. It's a term from the Kalam. They're simply picked by someone, hmm. chosen, as it were, not, not for a reason, but arbitrarily, by will. Okay? And so that's a second fact about the heavens, all right, from which you can argue for the existence of somebody who picked her, a particularizer, a hmm. deity with a will. All right, that created and maintains the heavens um, in, 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 that kind of, in that kind of motion. Um, so there's these two different arguments. When Maimonides himself comes to give an argument, he, he gives neither the argument of the philosophers. He, he, he presents it, but it's, it, they're problematic in various ways. And he has various criticisms of the Kalam argument for a particularizer. But he comes up with, with, with what he says is an indubitable, certain um, unquestionable proof, mm. and it's in the form of what's known as a as a, um, a constructive dilemma. This was a stoic form of argument. Okay, mm -hmm. it's not really excluded in the middle, although people think of it like that. There are two possibilities: either the world is generated, created, or it's not generated. It has no beginning. It's eternal. Okay, he argues if it's generated, originated, created, then it has to have a creator. Okay. A particular riser, somebody who brought it into existence after not existence. If it's eternal and necessary, well, it still requires a mover, a cause of its eternal continuous motion. Remember, for Aristotle, causes can be simultaneous with their effects, sort of vertical causes. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, and that, and there can't be an infinite chain of those. So there has to be a first such mover, right? And that's the deity. So if the world's created, there is a creator. If the world is eternal, there is a first cause. The world is either created or it's eternal. Therefore, okay, there has to exist this, this cause, this ultimate explanation or reason or agent, all right, and that's God. Mm. It's QED, God is proven, okay? Now, I ref there, there are all sorts of obvious questions you can ask. Is it the same God that's being proven by the two lemmas, for example, okay? Um, one's a creator, the other is a... First, a prime mover, a first cause, okay? And I argue that, in fact, he thinks of both of these ultimate, you know, causes or agents as what he, he takes over a term from Avicenna called the necessary existence, right? Which is not an intellect, um, a prime mover in the usual Aristotelian sense, but something much more transcendent. Um, 
And um, I, I mean, not go into details of that, but he gives you this proof, okay, which he says is third. And look, there are only two alternatives here, so it's exa- they're exhaustive, okay. Therefore, the conclusion, if it, the conclusion does follow from the two lemmas, all right, it's necessary, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, it can't be challenged. However, okay, do we have an explanation of how these part, this particularizer or the prime mover okay moves the heavens mm. either irregularly or in the eternal motion and I argue that no we don't have and and the kind of explanation you presume we would think it would be an explanation in terms of final causes purposes right um but purposes, you know, final causes, there are also efficient causes, and they're, they're get conflated with formal causes. Okay, let me not go into all the details, okay? He argues that, in fact, we, we don't have an understanding of that cause. Of, we can't explain the motion, how the motions are caused um, by these, these agents or this first cause. So we lack any understanding of the conclusion that then follows from, right, from these motions, hmm. So although the proof turns out to be certain, there's no – either way, you have to acknowledge that there exists some sort of cause or agent, okay, a necessary existence, okay. We have absolutely no understanding of how that agent actually functions as the cause of these um, – of the motions of the spheres. So we're left without understanding. We're left then without an explanation and without knowledge. So that's an example of what he has in mind and what I – I just said that we don't have an understanding. In fact, he gives you a parable to express an antinomy um, that arises from the theory of final causes, where the cause always has to be more noble than the effect. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, and I'm sorry, where the effect has to be more noble than the than the cause. All right, and the nature of the kind of causation which would be um, in, which would be operative here. Um, according to Aristotle, whenever you have causation, the two, the cause and the effect have to be contiguous to one another. They have to come into contact with one another. That's obviously going to be impossible if you're dealing with an immaterial being like Aristotle's first cause or this, you know, this deity of the, um, this particularizer. So in order to baptize the kind of causal relation, um, since it can't be, there's no material contiguity, um, Maimonides um, enlists this Neoplatonic term, which we call, um, which he call, which Penis translates as overflow. We usually call it emanation. Arabic is the term fide. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, simply to baptize what this relation is, okay? But fi- emanation always goes from the more noble to the less noble. Mm-hmm. Final causation goes from the less noble to the more noble effect, okay? Um, that's an antinomy because it can't both emanate and be a final cause because then the effect would have to be less noble than the emanating cause. Mm. So you actually see, I mean, that's the kind of problem when you start probing how everybody's got to believe then have, with certainty that God exists. And I'll give you a proof yeah. to induce you to believe this with certainty, okay? Look at the heavens. Either they're eternal or they're irregular. Either way, there has to be some sort of cause, okay? But then, so everybody's going to believe that, that there has to exist a cause of the motions of the heavens, if so facto a God. But then when you start probing, how does this, exp- how does this argument actually work, okay? Then you'll begin to see problems. And this kind of anten- this antinomy, which I just briefly sketched, is the kind of, you know, insight, impar- incomplete understanding that we have of how this, this goes, right? That's yes. what I meant by the inner meaning. Okay, right. so that's one argument um, for limitations. Then you have a second argument, which I said earlier, which is in the next chapter, which is which which has to do with the nature of God. And there, what he argues is that in order to have knowledge, you have to have a representation. Um, and this is a, a much more modern kind of, yes. of argument about knowledge. He t- he's actually taking it over from Avicenna. Um, so there's no cognition without representation. And he imposes a constraint also that in order to make a knowledge claim, not only what you claim to know has to be true, but how you represent what you're representing, what you're claiming to know. 
also has to be true. So how you how you the form of the representation also has to be true to the subject matter. So if you want to prove, let's say, that God is one, an absolute unity, absolutely simple. Okay, you would somehow have if you want to claim to know that you'd have to be able to represent it to that claim to yourself that God is one in an absolutely simple form. But all of our propositions, for example, the proposition that God is one, have a subject and a predicate. The subject presupposes a substratum or an essence. The predicate presupposes an attribute, right? The subject or the substratum and the attribute have to be composed together to form one entity, okay? That's already a kind of composition that violates the simplicity of God. So here, even if you can demonstrate that God is one, so what you, what you claim to know is true, how you're representing it using that syntax, all right, um, misrepresents what you're representing, and so you don't really have knowledge. So let me let me just I mean we're actually uh, running, out of, running out of time yeah um, so I so your 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 chapters at the end I mean you you address directly the the question of you know what sort of life we're supposed to live you know given the exalted you know the intellectual you know perfection um, versus you know what is actually humanly possible. Um, but I think we're, we're sort of out of time at this point to, to get there, um, and I'll just have to leave that to, you know, as something that readers should be encouraged to, um, to read for themselves. Um, so let me, let me just wrap up by asking um, uh, what your next project is. I mean, are you, are you going to follow this up with something related, or are you going back to something more directly, philosophy of language? Um, you know, what's what's next for you? Well, as always, I'm doing both. I, right now, I'm thinking a lot about quotation um, in the philosophy of language and the relationship between language and non-linguistic representation. So I think that quotations are pictures. But I'm also working on a, another book um, on Maimonides, and this is his interpretation of the parable according to my account of what he takes a parable to be, of the Binding of Isaac story, uh-huh. um, which I argue is is one a critique of the ideal um, of religious psychology that, to, that dying for God is the true expression of love of God. And it's a critique of martyrdom then. Uh-huh. Um, and that's one interpretation. The inner meaning is a critique it's another it's a critique of it's a skeptical critique of prophecy in other words that prophecy does not yield um knowledge um and he takes the story of the binding of isaac also to communicate that that although abraham was certain um of the prophecy um that certainty did not furnish the kind of understanding or knowledge that would justify him actually carrying out what he takes to be you know, whatever the act is that he's performing there. Wow. Well, this, I mean, you've raised a lot of very interesting questions, and I'm, I'm sorry that we don't, you know, have more time to explore them. But um, I do appreciate the time that you've you've given for the, for the interview and for a, um, a very interesting book. So thank you um, for your You're very welcome. Time. Thanks for the chance to talk to you. Okay. So, Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to my interview with Joseph Stern, the William H. Colvin Professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Chicago and Director of the Chicago Center for Jewish Studies. We've been talking about his new book, The Matter and Form of Maimonides' Guide, just out from Harvard University Press. I'm Carrie Figdor. This is New Books in Philosophy. I hope you enjoyed the podcast, and thank you for listening. 